Such a joyful song on such a joyful day. Certainly appreciate Brother Ben for leading us in that song. And thank you all for still being here with us today to, to share in the joyous occasion that uh, of having our new brother in Christ. I just want to say that in Luke chapter 15 and verse 7, the Bible says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need repentance. Three verses now, the Lord said in verse 10, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Walker, I want you to know, and I want anyone else who is thinking about obeying the gospel to know that when you did and when, if you do obey the gospel, there is rejoicing in heaven. We've been rejoicing here today while the angels in heaven have rejoiced Amen. to Amen. obey the gospel. That's right. And what a glorious day it is. And it's and, and so the joy that we have, we can give the glory to God. It's amazing how that how that things work out with God, isn't it? We talked in our first lesson about the things that we are to do for God are done for his good pleasure. Whatever we do for God reciprocates right back to us. Giving God the glory should bring joy to us. And how thankful we are that God is such a loving God and he works in this way. So thank you. Thank you for those of you that have participated in the worship service so far today. Thank you for the response that we've had to the truth, the example that's been said. I was actually thinking as well, that though we didn't get a chance to have our normal Bible study, what an education people got here today to see what happens when the gospel is preached, when somebody obeys the gospel, and why somebody would obey the gospel. Somebody would be baptized. Why go through? You can think about everything that we just went through. Somebody, went, we waited so that we could get everything just right so that we could be sure to fully immerse Walker in this water. Some people might say, well, that just, why didn't you just wait a couple of weeks? Why didn't you just do another time or whatever? Because we wanted to obey God. Amen. Walker yeah. wanted to become a Christian. Right. And glory to God that we, we were able to see that in action today. When I was... Standing up here before you earlier, and when Walker had decided he wanted to obey the gospel, one of the things that I mentioned to you was about Acts chapter 8. See, in Acts chapter 8, we read about the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, Philip the Evangelist went down to Samaria and preached the word of God. There were people down there that, that heard him preach, they saw him perform the miracles that he did, they gained faith in God, and they repented and were baptized with the forgiveness of their sins. The Ethiopian eunuch stands as an example of somebody who is who has a good and honest heart and who is willing to obey when presented with the truth. And in our second lesson this evening, I would like to talk to you about the Ethiopian eunuch. However, not the one in Acts chapter 8. What's that you say? There's another one? There's another Ethiopian eunuch somewhere? Yes, yes there is, in the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 38. You see, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 isn't the only eunuch in the Bible that can teach us a few things. Though certainly the one in Acts chapter 8 is the one that, that I hope that you have studied about and you will continue to study about, and you will continue to learn about his receptiveness to the gospel, his necessity to confess Jesus to be the Son of God and his need to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. But all the way back in Jeremiah chapter 38, there is another eunuch that the Bible talks about who is a man that, that had courage, a man that spoke up when there was a, a need, when someone was in, in peril and they needed someone to be a voice for them. And there are lessons that we can learn from this account of this unit. I want to read the first 13 verses of Jeremiah 38, and we'll get into the lesson. It says, And now Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Peshur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Peshur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord. Now, so these four men, they heard a prophecy that Jeremiah was making. Jeremiah was warning the people. And they heard this warning. That's what it's saying here. 
This is the warning. This is what Jeremiah says God is saying to them. Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Now that's the warning. That was the, the prophecy of God that Jeremiah had been saying to these people over and over. And these four men, they didn't want to hear it, so they plot together. And it says here in verse 4, um, <coughs> Therefore the princess said to the king, Please let this man be put to death, for thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah, now don't forget that name. Now we're not going to talk a whole lot about Zedekiah today, but my intent is, is that we're going to look at another lesson, probably, Lord's willing, maybe next week. That is the other side of the coin. The other side of courage would be cowardice. Zedekiah is another character, another person in this story who is, as, you, as we'll see as we read these next few verses, he's a coward. He's somebody that is wishy-washy. Because here's these people coming to him, and they want him to let them capture Jeremiah. Later on in the story, when we get to the other eunuch, he comes to the king and says, let me rescue Jeremiah. And the same king who just previously said, take him, says, okay, go rescue him. And then there's more to say about him in another time. So he's a very, very wishy-washy kind of person. Please let this man be put to death, for thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them, for this man does not seek the welfare of his people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah the king said, Look, he is in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you. You see there, here he's being cowardice. He's supposed to be the king. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of, Mal of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire, so Jeremiah sank in the mire. So just imagine a well, an empty well, and, and, and so the water's been drained out of it. So what's in there is just a bunch of mud and muck. And so once you lower somebody in there, they're probably just going to keep on sinking. Uh, it's going to be hard to move, <coughs> hard to do anything. You're just kind of stuck. Not, it, it's not necessarily like quicksand, of course, but it's muddy. It's almost like a second tar, you might say. And it's just almost impossible, pretty much impossible to get out. No food, no water, nothing down there. So they put him down there. Now, he had Nile, the Ethiopian. Here is that other eunuch. Now, Abed Malek, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. When the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, ebed melech went out to the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded ebed melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here thirty men with you, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So he bade me late, took the men with him, and went into the house of the king under the treasury, and took from there old clothes and old rags, and let them down by ropes into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Then he bade me late, the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes, and Jeremiah did so. <coughs> so they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes, and lifted him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Of course, there's more to the book of Jeremiah and more uh, that can be said about uh, the fate of the king and, and these princes and, and, and the city and so forth. But, and there's a little bit more to say about Ebed and Melech a little bit later on. But for, for now, I want you to think about the story that's been painted. Here you have Jeremiah who has been prophesying this warning that the city's going to fall. And here's how you can escape. So he gave them the warning and the way of escape, and these princes didn't like what they heard, so they go to the king, this wishy-washy king, and convince him to let them take Jeremiah, put him in this, in this uh, muddy, terrible, damp, dark uh, place to die down in this well that no one could escape on their own, 
And then just shortly after that, when Evan Milet comes along, he being this, this king's servant, one of the king's servants, sees what happened, hears about what happens, and decides he's going to act. He's going to do something. And being the kind of person that he is, that is, in the position that he was in, that required a lot of courage on his part to go to the king and advocate for Jeremiah. There's a lot that can be learned from this unit. A lot that you and I can take away and apply to our lives spiritually when we think about the actions that he took and his disposition towards the wrongdoing that had been committed against Jeremiah. So let's think about some of those things for the remaining time that we have here today. The first thing I, that I see in Ebed Melech is that he had the courage to speak what was right. He had the courage to speak up when... There was a person that, that couldn't speak up. And he had the courage to speak up when there was injustice and when there was ill respect towards another human being and towards God because this was one of God's prophets. This was a man who was speaking for God. And so in verses 7 through 9, we find that they had put him in that, in that well. And he bade me lay. He... Being in the king's house, it says he waited. He, he found out where the king was at. The king was down there at the gate of Benjamin. And he goes to him. And he says, this is wrong. There, this is a wrongdoing. Let, let us go and, and rescue this prophet, just to paraphrase him. He was moved. You know, you think about what happened, I think, is, is what it was, was he was moved with righteous indignation. Right. When here was an injustice. Here was someone who was simply trying to warn the king, save lives, and all he was doing was preaching the truth to them. They didn't want to hear it. Again, just kind of remember that, because if you go back and you, and you think about some of the things that are said to Jeremiah uh, by, by the king and by others, they, he's a troubler for repeating these warnings from God. They don't want to hear it. And no matter how much you may reject the truth, the truth still stands. No matter how much we don't want to listen to the warnings of God, those warnings are still just as powerful to God and to those that are willing to listen that as even if others don't want to hear them. But here he was moved by righteous indignation. And that's what I want, to, I want you to think about. Are you moved by righteous... Are you, do you have righteous indignation? Are you moved when there is injustice? We could probably talk about various injustices for the rest of the day. Now, I just want to think about two of them. I think about what happened in the book of John, chapter 2. In John, chapter 2, we see the people in the day of Jesus, they were disrespecting God. And I think that is probably the first and most uh, severe uh, form uh, of an injustice that I would hope would motivate each of us to have righteous indignation. Righteous indignation means that you're angry. That you are very mad, but you're very mad for the cause of God. You're very angry towards this wickedness that's occurred that has violated the will of God and that is disrespecting God. In John chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, you may recall when Jesus drove people out of the temple and it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal for your house has eaten me up. The words righteous indignation aren't listed there, but that's exactly what Jesus has. Jesus was angry at these people. He took the time to make a whip that he used to drive these people out. He flipped over tables, and he told them not to make his father's house a house of merchandise. These people were disrespecting God. They were disrespecting God's place of worship at that time. That was their system of worship there at the temple. And what they were doing was profaning it by making it into this, this place of commerce instead. Now that moved our Lord. And what I want you to get from that is, is that when we see or hear 
people of our day, whether it be in a religious setting, or whether it be when we're out at work or in the marketplace, where we're just out socializing, whatever it is, when people are disrespecting God, whether it be through profanity, through their actions, whatever it is that they're doing, that should move you. That should not be something that we just turn a blind eye to. Right. It should be something that drives us to want to speak up and to say something. Jeremiah had this great injustice done towards him. And ebed Melech was moved with righteous indignation. Righteous indignation is a great motivator. It motivated this lowly servant to go to the king after the king had just given permission for people to put Jeremiah into this, into this makeshift dungeon and to request to get him out. And that takes courage. That took a lot of courage. And that's an example of courage for you and I today. You know what? I think we should be moved by today. Another form of righteous, or another injustice that we see today that should move us with righteous indignation. I think about the, the society that we live in today, how it has embraced sexual immorality in so many different ways. Whether it be homosexuality, this trans agenda they got going on, whether it be just marriage and divorce for any cause, whatever it is, people, uh, sex out of wedlock, so many things that you could add to that list that our society treats as the norm is nothing but the norm. It is totally and utterly against the will of God. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says the following here, he says in chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and each woman <coughs> have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the, due, the affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. When we see and hear about those that just blatantly violate this. This should move us with righteous indignation. We should be angry that our children are exposed to such filth as they're going through school. And when they get online and check out the internet, when they get on social media, and, and they see these things depicted as, as the norm, when they're nothing, when they could be, that could be further from the truth. You should speak up. We should say something. We should warn our children. We should make sure our children are not being exposed to these kind of things. We should make sure they know what is right. We need to speak up. Because, you know, there's people that can't. There's people that, that need someone to speak up for them. And that person that needs to speak up for them might be you. I think about, how about the unborn? I think about what the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, chapter 139. In Psalm 139, verses 13 through 15, we read about the unborn. <clears throat> For you formed me you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Here in just these three verses, the psalmist writer paints the picture of a child that is unborn. And yet, we have a world and more closer to home, a country where just, just killing children is nothing. It's nothing to them. You know, I know some research and online according to the Pew according to Pew Research, in 2021, there were 625,978 abortions in the United States. Now the year before that, 597,355. Now the year before that, <coughs> 607,720. Now, I can't do all that math off the top of my head, but that's pretty close to 1.8 million, I believe. And you know, I've done some other research. I didn't put it up here on the board, but I looked up online, what is the population of Pike County? And I believe it was somewhere a little bit below 60,000. And so, over in three years' time, I don't know, what's it, 10 times, 100 times, population of Pike County. Just take Pike County and just wipe it out. Over 
and over and over. Sounds, sounds atrocious. It should probably cause you to have a little bit of a, a, a knot in your stomach. It's gut-wrenching. And yet, that's the norm. That's the norm for people. And there are people today that are fighting for the right to keep on killing, to keep on killing children. Who's going to speak up for them? We have to. Amen. It has to be us. It has to be God's people that speak up for the unborn, for those that don't have a voice. We have to remind our children that, that abortion, it's not okay. It's not my body, my choice. That's a person that's being murdered. murdered. Sometime Amen. down the road, we're going to talk about that in one of our, in one of our uh, Sunday morning Bible classes in more detail. That's all it is. They might use nice little words like fetus and, 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 thing, or, and things like that, but it's a person Amen. that's being killed. <clears throat> now on the other side, add a few years and think about some of the elderly people. You know, unfortunately, in our society, there's a lot of elder abuse that goes on too. There's a lot of people that are placed in nursing homes and forgotten about. There's a lot of people whose caretakers are, are just, just horrible to them. There's people that have been taken advantage of. And the Bible tells us in James 1, 27 that one of the things that you and I are to do that, that is in line with, the, with what is pure and undefiled religion before God is to not only visit the fatherless, not only, be, not only think about the unborn children as well, uh, those who are not even given a chance to be born and have a father, but also the widows, those who are an elderly, in other words, those who are older, we who are able-bodied, need to make sure that we're taking care of those that are older than us too. They need you and me to speak up for them. Even Melech understood that Jeremiah had an injustice that was done to him and he needed to speak up when no one else would. And that person is probably you right now in the life of someone. Somebody out there needs you to speak up for them. And they need you to have the courage not only to speak up what is right, but the courage to lead them, perhaps, to on the right path. In verse 10, you may recall that the king commands him to take some people with him. It says in verse 10, Then the king commanded the Ebed and the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here thirty men with you, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Now here comes Ebed and Melech along the way. And he advocates for Jeremiah. Now on the one hand, on the one hand, you might say that when he goes to the king, leadership is thrust upon him. But the more I look at this, the more I realize it's not that leadership was actually thrust upon him. He's embraced it. I mean, the fact that he acted and went and said something on his own shows me that he was a leader. There was a leader right there. And all he needed was the chance. All he needed was the opportunity to be in the right place at the right time and have the resources that necessary to allow him to lead others and to do what was right. And that's what the king does, is gives him the opportunity to do so. Now, you and I as Christians are in an have an opportunity to lead others. Lead others to the Lord. To lead others out of the path of danger. To lead others to what is right. You know, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33 and verse 8, Ezekiel warns us about the dangers of us not telling the wicked that they're in sin. And not teaching people that they need to get out of that erroneous path. And that if we fail to warn the wicked, that, and that wicked uh, person does not repent, their blood's upon us. So there are people in our lives, perhaps, that we have been entrusted with. I say entrusted, but what I really mean is people that we can influence. We talked about that yesterday as well in our, in our men's class. Influence. Every one of you have influenced people one way or another. Young and old. You do. Every one of us influences people that are, uh, you, know, you know, in the management realm, there, there's, this kind of, there's this idea of communicating uh, horizontally and vertically. You communicate with people that are over you, your, your, your bosses. You communicate with people that perhaps report to you. You communicate with people that are on the same level as you. Well, the same is true when it comes to our relationships with one another. The children and parents and friends and, uh, and students and their teachers. We all influence one another in one way or the other. And the question is, is how are you utilizing that influence? And what are you doing with that influence? And who are you influencing? Who needs to be doing the influence? And I would say everybody. Husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, 
children, big brothers, little brothers, big sisters, little sisters. You need to be a friend to someone, and your friend needs to, is going needs to be a, a positive influence to you, whether it be your coworkers or maybe even the person that you're serving at the table. Maybe you're in a position where, where you're supposed to offer someone an alcoholic drink for your job, but you choose not to. I know someone like that. I'm proud of them for doing that. I'm rather, I'm proud of them for not offering. There you go. You got influence. We all have influence. And we have to utilize that influence. And he bet me like was in a situation where he had the opportunity to get the king's ear. And so he made an advocate, he, he made uh, advocacy for Jeremiah. And he spoke up. Husbands, you have the responsibility to lead your home and to protect your family. But mothers, you have a responsibility as well. Children, not only do you need to listen to your parents, but you have, maybe you have cousins or, or younger siblings, those of you that are the older children. Those of you that are younger, you have children, or rather siblings that may be older than you, but you know what? You may know what's right and they may not. You can still try to influence them. Everyone, everyone can in some way can try to do their best to influence others. Do you know what that means? You have a purpose. I mentioned that to you in our first lesson today. You have a purpose. Now, Ibn Melech had a purpose, and one of the things that leaders do is leaders lead with a purpose. And his purpose was, I need to get Jeremiah out of there. I need to get Jeremiah out of that dungeon before he dies. So he knew what he had to do. He had a focus. He had a goal. And he was leading 30 or 3, however many men it was, to you. And what some commentators say think that the 30 men was some kind of typo or, or mis, miswriting or whatever, and it should have been 3. Either way, I know this. He didn't go alone. He took people with him. He took others with him. He was leading others. He was not, so he was giving them a chance to see what was right, what should have been done right. I'm sure they were able to, to, to see what was going on and to, and to also uh, just, just feel the, the, the anger that he had and the urgency that he had about the matter. And I'm sure that he shared that with them and that influenced them positively as well. Let me ask you a question. Do you know people? Do you know people today that need Jesus? Huh, sure we do. Do you know somebody or somebody's that needs to learn about Jesus and be, be introduced to Jesus so that Jesus can pull them out of the dungeon of Satan. So he can pull them to safety through the gospel like Walker did today when he obeyed the gospel this morning. Do you think about their situation with the same sense of urgency that even me like did with Jeremiah? You know, he didn't have much time. But we may not have much time with those that we are having the chance to influence. I don't know how long Jeremiah could have stayed there, but it couldn't have been long. He's in there, he's probably sinking, and, and even if his feet did, did land on something that, he could, that could stop him from sinking, surely his breathing was going to be impacted by the mud and everything, and eventually he's going to starve and die. He didn't have one time. Who knows how much air was done in there? Who knows how long he had? Who knows how long that person that you are aware of, that you're thinking about right now, who knows how long you have to influence them before it's too late? Who knows? So what do you do? You speak up while you can. Right. You speak up and you do what's right while you can. I think about what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul said, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So there's what we're going to use to win those souls out of the clutches of the, of the devil's dungeon. Continue in doing, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both. Both. Not just yourself, but those who which you have the ability to influence. In doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Speak up. Be like Ebed Mele. Learn from the other unit this lesson. You just never know. You never know. Somebody's listening. You may not be aware of it. People are listening. And you might just say one thing. And that one thing is what they need to hear. That one thing is what will save that person 
from making the worst mistake of their life, from going and getting involved in something that will start a chain reaction that will, that will be uh, detrimental to them for the rest of their life. One person, one person, and that one person could be you, can speak up and say what is needed in order to help others escape from danger. I want to talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute, but let's move on to verse 11. By the way, who is it that you can lead the same people that you are responsible for? Your father, your mother, your children, your brothers, all the same. <coughs> who are those people to lead? Same list of people. Everybody. Anybody that you come in contact with. He had the courage to act, verse 11. So he bade me like, took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took from there old clothes and old rags and let them down by ropes into the dungeon to Jeremiah. So here's what happened. Ebed Melech, he needed tools. He needed, the, he needed certain things in order to lift Jeremiah up out of, out of the mire. It wasn't just enough to, to send down ropes because it, those ropes that they went under his arms, considering the, the, the condition that his body was probably in at that point, he needed something that wouldn't allow the ropes to burn him and, and, and to cut into his arms and such. So that's the reason why he would need these old rags and these old clothes. But what these are is they're, they're tools. He needed these tools in order to save Jeremiah. <coughs> what about you and me? Do we need tools? Are there certain tools that we could use in order to rescue the lost? Sure there are. The tools that we need in order to be able to speak up for those that can't speak up for themselves? Yes, there are. Of course, you know, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the whole armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God. So he mentions all these things there in Ephesians chapter 6 as uh, the tools that we need, the sword of the Spirit being the final thing he mentions there, that is the Word of God, so that we can have a weapon along with the different uh, defensive uh, aspects of the, of the armor of God that he mentions there. <laughs> what about you and me? Are there tools that we need that will allow us to wield the armor, uh, that will allow us to wield the sword of the Spirit and wear the armor of God so that we are prepared to speak up for, the, for those that can't speak for themselves? And I, think, and I think the answer to that question is yes. And the first thing, and, and the main thing you need is knowledge. You, you know, Ebed Melech was aware of where he could go get the tools. He was aware of where he could go get the things that he needed to, to help Jeremiah come up out of there, to sit down there for, and put under his arms. You and I need tools. And our main tool, the weapon, is the Bible, the Word of God. And you need to know what is in it, so you need to study it. Some of those tools might be not only your Bible, but maybe, maybe a study aid, like a workbook, or, or uh, listen to some sermons, or something along those lines. Read the Bible. That's one of the things that the elders have, have, have instructed us to do this year, and encouraged us to do. But you need to make sure that you've got the knowledge. You need to know how, you know what, People need in order to get out of the dungeon, and you know how, how to convey it to them. And you can't do that without knowledge. That's why it's so important and necessary for us to study the Word of God, to show ourselves to prove to God, and be workmen that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the Word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. So you need knowledge. And I would also suggest something else that you need. How many of us never had the time? How many of us are always struggling with time? I'm not talking about what time it is right now. I'm trying not to look at the moment here. But time. How many of us say, well, you know what? I would love to study such and such. I just don't have the time. I would love to go talk to so-and-so, but I just don't have the time. We all struggle with time. And so let me suggest to you three things that we can do that can help us, uh, you know, in our toolkit of, of spiritual growth and of preparation. Plan the time. And what I mean by that is, is you might say, you know what, I'm going to make sure that every Monday at 8 o'clock I'm going to read the Word of God. Or every, every Tuesday at 7 o'clock I'm going to study a workbook. Whatever. But make sure you plan that. Because if you don't plan it, what's going to happen is, is, is you're just never going to get around to it. This is going to be, if you try to manage it on the, by, by the place come up. But you plan it. And that way you can make, whenever that something comes up, you can say, well, I've already got such and such plan on. So you plan it. And you plan where you're going to study. I'm going to go to my, to my bedroom and close the door. I'm going to go out of my car and sit down where it's quiet. I don't know. But plan the where. And plan what you're going to study. Maybe there's a certain topic in the Bible that you're struggling with. And so you've decided you're going to study that. 
And let me give you a practical way to put these three together. I still understand time, the time and the where and the what. It's easier said than done, and I get that. Let me, let me just suggest to you something that I do, or that I've been trying to get back in the habit of doing. I used to be pretty good at it, got out of the habit, and I've been trying to get myself back in the habit. And that is, just listen to sermons while you're driving. How many of us are drivers here? Almost everybody. How many of us go to work, and how many of us travel? How many of us are going from taking the kids to school or going to the grocery store? All you got to do these days is get on your cell phone. You can go to different congregations' websites at East End, uh, Oakland Church of Christ. We've got them on, on, on our web. Uh, if you go to our website, you can click a link from there and go to, to YouTube or to our Facebook. Listen to some of the ones that we've put on here. Play them in your car while you're driving down the road. And French, that's, that's wonderful. That will help you to learn and that will help you to grow. Matter of fact, I was doing that just recently and one of the things I heard a preacher tell was a story about how one person influenced another person by something they said. And you know what? That person that influenced this person over here didn't even know that they were listening. Sadly, it was a negative influence. Let me tell you what, what that was all about because we need to be careful what we say. There was a man who was a preacher. I think he was a preacher for about maybe 30 years or something. And for about 30 years, the, the, the preacher was dealing with all kinds of different problems and he never asked anybody for help. He tried to handle all of those problems himself. And then finally one day, he, he, he just couldn't handle it anymore. And he finally reached out for help. I don't remember if he reached out to other preachers or to the elders. I can't remember that part of the story. But he finally reached out to someone for help. And the reason he never reached out to others for help for so long was because when he was younger, when he was probably maybe 18, he was at a Bible study. And the person that was teaching the Bible study was late for the study. And when they came in, as they walked past him, he heard them mumble under their breath something along the lines of, why can't, why can't people just handle their own problems? Something like that. He'd been taking care of some problems. And he just mumbled that under his breath. But that young man heard him. And for the next 20, 30 years, he decided, I'm not going to let that be me. I'm not going to let whatever the problems are, I'm not going to worry about letting them get beyond me. And that affected him for 30 years. So now we need to take that example and we need to flip that on its head and we need to make sure that what we say has the positive effect on others. You speak up and you influence people in the, in the righteous way. You turn them toward the Lord. You don't, you don't harm, but you help with the things that you say. I hope you, get to, I hope you understand that. We need to make sure then that we utilize our time. You know what else might help you? Just brethren. Ebed Melech took people with him. Thirty-three. He took people with him. Isn't it a lot easier? When you go back to the first lesson this morning, we talked about laboring in the kingdom of Christ. And we've talked about evangelizing. I don't know about you, but I know as far as I'm concerned that if we're going to say and we're going to go door knocking, I don't want to go by myself. <laughs> it's more encouraging when there's others with you. Amen. Not only that, you sit down and you have a study. By yourself, that's great. But when you get a good little Bible discussion going on, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better and more enjoyable than a bunch of people getting together that are Christians and talking about the Word of God. It's such an enjoyable thing. I'd rather talk about that than anything else. I like my Star Trek, and I love talking about it Sister Roxy. I love talking about the Bible, too. There's such joy in that. Other brethren. You get, along, you get around some other brethren, they can help you. They can help you to grow. They can help you to, to sharpen your skills and to, and to hone the tools that you need in your toolbox. He didn't even worry. You see, he, he didn't even worry. You think about what, here's this place in the court. Jeremiah's down in there. It's going to take some time to put the, the rope down there and those rags down there. And, <coughs> get him out. and don't forget, there's those four princes that didn't like Jeremiah that wanted him put in there. And so here goes Ebed Melech down there to rescue him. It's a good thing he took those extra people with him for the protection as well. And it's good when we take other brethren with us who can watch out for us, not only literally, but spiritually. That's why we need one another to help encourage one another. But he, he didn't even worry. Do you think that there's dangers that we can face today? Sure, the going places by yourself, maybe. You could be physically harmed. But not just that. We know that the third brethren that are in other countries that don't have the relative safety that we have here. People that are in danger of diseases and in danger of, uh, of, of some just horrible things being 
snake bitten as they go out and try to evangelize in some of these countries, or, or, or various diseases, or, or the threat of, of imprisonment. We've had brethren that's come here and held gospel meetings and told us about uh, situations like that. Even here in our own area, perhaps you can find yourself, perhaps you can find yourself at odds with maybe somebody's parents. You can find yourself at odds with a coworker. You find yourself at odds with somebody that doesn't uh, agree with what the Bible says. And you may find yourself in a situation where it's not quite as safe as you thought it was going to be. But he met Ebed Mele, still yet acting. He had the courage to act. In verse 12 and verse 13, we see that he had the courage to save a life. It says in verse 12, Then Ebed Malad the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So here he was, down in there. He had probably, it doesn't tell us that anybody ran out there and said, Hey, we're trying to get you out. So he, he probably thought it, he was out of hope. He was, he was going to die. And yet here they come to his rescue. I wonder how thankful he was. One person. Do you think Jeremiah was thankful? I am sure he was. And you know, here we are today talking about this. This one man who probably had no idea the impact that he was having on Jeremiah the people that would read about this afterwards, and those of us like you and I that's come along here today, and the lessons that we can learn. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, it talks about how that Jesus is our advocate. Let me ask you something. How if Jeremiah was thankful to Ebed Melech for pulling him out of, out of that little dungeon, how much more thankful should we be for what our Lord has done for us? Amen. For the Lord putting himself on the cross and dying there, for the forgiveness of our sins. How thankful should we be that he continues to advocate for us even today. Those of us who are children of God, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. When we go to God in prayer, we pray to God through Jesus. He is, he is sitting at the right hand of God and he is advocating for you and me when we stumble, when we are in danger, when we are feeling hopeless. When we are joyful, when we are thankful, He is there. We should be thankful for, for that more than anything else, that our Lord is our advocate. And be thankful for the spiritual support that the Lord has left us. Jeremiah was probably extremely thankful that not only was he getting pulled out of that, out of that little makeshift prison or whatever you want to call it there, out of that well, but it was probably a little comforting to know he didn't have all that burn and stuff that was going on here. He, and he had these people that were going to be there to help him when he got out. Walker obeyed the gospel today. A couple of people, uh, Kyrie and Faith obeyed the gospel just a few weeks ago. We've had several here. Brother Scotty and, and has obeyed the gospel fairly recently. And all of these new converts in Christ can take, just don't worry, just remove some of those worries you might have. You can take pleasure in knowing and relief in knowing there's a spiritual support system for you. You're not alone. We didn't just dump you in this water and let you come out as a new creature in Christ and say, okay, see ya. Good luck. No, no problem. The Lord has left us with all things that pertain to life and godliness. That we all, new convert, people that's been around for a while, can use to grow and to grow spiritually. And we need to be thankful for that. I'm thankful that God did not leave us instructions that He says He's going to use on the day of judgment, the judge was by and didn't leave us everything that we needed in order to adhere to them. What a God we have. Amen. So be thankful for the spiritual support that the Lord has, has given to each of us. Even Melech was one person. And this one person went to the king and spoke up for this man of God. And there are other people that you can read about in scriptures that set that example too. Think about, for instance, Naaman. We're in Naaman the leper in 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, Naaman the leper in 2 Kings chapter 5. He goes down to, he goes to, the, first of all, he goes to the king of Israel. And the king tells him, you know, who, who am I? You know, I, I, can't, I can't do anything. And so then Elisha the prophet hears about him. 
And then Elisha sends for him. Naaman goes down to Elisha. Elisha tells him to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. Naaman gets angry about that. Naaman's servants, uh, servant or servants, they convince him, you know, why not? It's nothing, no, no big deal. If he'd asked you to do something great, you would have done it. So he goes down, he dips seven times in the River Jordan, and comes out, the Bible says, clean like a baby. Shortly after that, Gehazi, one of Elisha's servants, gets greedy, goes to Naaman and asks for some things, tells him this lie. When Gehazi gets back to Elisha, Elisha ends up <laughs> telling him how wicked he was, and he ends up having the leprosy that Naaman did. But you know, all those events were set off by one person. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2, in 2 Kings, I'm over in Isaiah, but in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 2, here you have this, this uh, girl that had been taken captive, and she's basically like a servant in the home of, of, of Naaman. And it says in verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. That's it. One thing. Just one person said something. Andrew. Andrew is the person that you read in Scripture who introduced Peter to Jesus. Come. We found, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. What a brother. What a brother Andrew was to Peter. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches the first gospel sermon. Peter is the one who will go on to write a couple of epistles. He was the one that went to the house of Cornelius and, and, and preached the gospel to the first Gentile converts. But it all started with one person, Andrew. Come, we have found him who's the Christ. He introduced him. What about you and me? One person. Are there people in our lives that maybe we could reach if we just spoke up and said one thing. One thing. People all over, right? People at school, people at work, people at home, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friends, your co-workers, and the list goes on. One per And that one person that says that one thing is you. It needs to be you. You never know. You never know. Amen. Come. The woman said in John chapter 2, or rather John chapter 4, the woman at the well, she, after she talked to Jesus, she went out, she said, come, come, this dear man that told me all things that ever I did, might just be that. Come, come to church. Come worship with us. Come on. You never know. You never know. Have the courage to trust God. Eva and Mila had the courage to speak up and to act and to lead and to save a lot. And in the end, what he was doing was showing his trust in God. In chapter 39, in chapter 39, in verse 15 it says, Meanwhile, the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to ebed Mila, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Have the courage. Your friends might, might forsake you. Your family may never want to speak to you again. But you trust in the Lord because that is right. Let me ask you, do you trust the Lord? Do you want to help others trust the Lord? Do you want to help others know Him? And do you want to be on the right side of judgment? Do you want to be on the right side? One of these days the Lord is going to come back and He's going to judge us. Here, God is bringing this judgment upon the children of Israel, or this, this king rather, and they've been warned and they've been warned and they've been warned. And now, here it is. Here comes the judgment. Nebed Melech is going to be spared because he trusted in God. <clears throat> so what do we need to do? Trust in God. The proverb writer says in Proverbs 29 25, the fear of man, that will bring a snare, 
But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Do you want to trust in the Lord? Do you want to be safe? When the judgment day comes, then you need to obey the Lord today while you have time. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. We encourage you to believe in Jesus, to repent of your sins, confess Jesus to be the Son of God, be baptized to have your sins washed away. Rise to walk in newness of life, trusting in the Lord. Maybe you're a child of God that fell away. Come back to God. Repent of your sins. Get back on the right track. We'll help you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We want you to be safe. We want you to be on the Lord's side. While together we stand and sing the invitation song. Oh,